Praise the Lord. Would you turn to first chapter of the book of Romans? As you see from the outline up there, we're dealing with the teaching concerning the fact that the whole world is guilty and condemned by God. And Paul sets forth the fact that the Gentiles are unrighteous and condemned. Then he will show that the Jews are unrighteous and condemned. The whole world is unrighteous and guilty and in need of salvation. Now we were looking last time at the reasons why that God was pouring out his wrath upon all flesh. Romans chapter 1, we see that there's a twofold revelation of God in the earth. Verse 17, for through the preaching of the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from one person who has faith to another who receives it by faith. That's one revelation. And then we were dealing with the other revelation, for the wrath of God is also being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. And we said there were five reasons that Paul sets forth here in chapter 1 why the wrath of God is at the present time being sent forth. There will be a future day of judgment to be sure, but at the present time the wrath of God is going forth. First of all, in verse 18, we showed you how that it's because they hold the truth in unrighteousness. And we told you how that that word means they hold back the truth by their unrighteousness. They're resisting it, holding back the truth. Another reason why that the wrath of God is being poured out upon all men, verse 21, because they do not glorify God as God. God is not honored as God. He's treated as if he doesn't exist or if his word and commands have no meaning or application to society. Neither were they thankful. If there's one thing that characterizes the world, it's they are unthankful. It's too bad when that sometimes characterizes the lives of professing Christians. They're not thankful. Another reason why his wrath is being poured out is because of their idolatry. We said, verse 23, they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into a picture of Jesus. Well, that's what it says, an image. <laughs> Well, we dealt with that already. Into an image made like unto corruptible man. You don't have any photographs of Jesus. If you've got a picture hanging in your home or in your church, if anybody's here, it's still wedded to the denominational apron strings. It's condemned by Scripture because Jesus came before photography and television for the precise purpose. He knows if man gets a picture of God in the flesh, that he'll transfer his affections and worship to that instead of the invisible God who is to be worshipped in truth and in spirit. Well, that's all on tape, isn't it? Now we come to two more reasons why the wrath of God is being poured out. And another is back in verse 18. It's being revealed, the wrath of God revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness, you see. Now those are not the same things. Ungodliness is all that's unlike God unlike his nature, his character. But unrighteousness is what people do. All sin, 1 John 5, 17, all sin is unrighteousness. All unrighteousness is sin. And so his wrath is being revealed against sinners because they're unlike him, they're ungodly, and because they are sinful. Another reason, we don't need to say any more about that because we've already more or less dealt with the idea and the other things. But that is another reason. The fifth reason is verse 28. God's pouring his wrath out because, verse 28, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. This is the basic cause for all sin. The seat and source of all sin is because sinners do not like to have God on their mind because they know to do that they're under condemnation and conviction and that is the seat and source of all sin. It's not that they lack the ability or the power to think upon God, to meditate upon his goodness and his mercy and his existence. You know, there's no excuse for evolution. I was listening to a program the other night taught by an Englishman and the English call it evolution and I thought how appropriate <laughs> for that word that it's a better pronunciation for evolution than we have in America. They call it evolution, and that's precisely what it is. 
But there's no excuse for denying the existence of God, for being an atheist or an agnostic, because verses 19 and 20 said that what is, can be known about God is manifested in man, because God has shown it unto us, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Clearly seen. Being understood by the things which are made. We can see it in the things that are made, creation. What can we see? His power, his divinity, the Godhead, his divinity. It doesn't mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You can see in nature, that takes special revelation, but his divinity. So they're without excuse. So it isn't that man can't see God and can't meditate upon God. It isn't he lacks the ability. Psalm 10.4 tells you why that man does not meditate upon God. It's simply because he doesn't want to. Let me read Psalm 10, 4 to you. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Psalm 10, verse 4. By the way, that's an illustration of another truth often stressed in this church, and that is that you alone have the power over your thoughts, what you admit into it. That is to say, if the sinner has the power to keep God out of his thoughts, Psalm 10, 4 says God is never in his thoughts. That's what Romans 1 here tells us also. If he has the power to keep God out of his thoughts, then why do you come whimpering to your pastor or to God that the devil is giving you a hassle in your mind when you have the power to keep him out? Yes, you can keep out that hate, that resentment, that lust, that bitterness, that defeat that failure, that fear, you can do it. Why don't you start believing you can? Well, of course, some of you do. Most of you do, but some of you don't. And I said whimpering because that's what it is. That's the way God looks at it. Read 1 Corinthians 10. He doesn't like crybabies who will not do what he says. He says there's no temptation overtakes you but such is common to man, and I will, he says, with every temptation make you a way of escape so you can bear it. Oh, I'll tell you, friends, we just stomp on people's feet all the time, don't we? Listen, I know I don't have any excuse, and I'm no better and no place that you're not or can't get. So if I know that I have no excuse, that I can keep the devil out of my thoughts, you can keep the devil out of your thoughts. Jesus didn't run around all the time counseling with people on how to keep the devil out of their thoughts. I have people all the time pray for me that I can keep all of these thoughts out. I just am losing the victory here and so forth. The wicked don't allow God in their thoughts. You see, you control that because God says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you are going to be what you think, thinking fear and failure and defeat and sickness and accident and trouble and adversity, that's largely what you'll get because Satan will accommodate you. Then if you turn that around and start thinking peace and joy and love and victory and healing and health and prosperity, God says you'll have that. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He tells us we've got the power. Now, a man will talk about what he thinks about. That's why you never hear the wicked talking about God, because he's not in their thoughts. They did not, do not like to retain God in their knowledge. They don't even want him on their mind. Man will talk about what he thinks about. And you can tell that they're lost and unregenerate because the name of God's never on their lips except in profanity and cursing, and then God's not on their mind but the devil. I mean, when a sinner has the name of God on his lips, it isn't God on his mind, it's the devil in his mind causing him to curse and blaspheme. Well, in what ways is God's wrath being revealed? We've shown you why. The apostle tells us why in Romans chapter 1. And the answer to that is the most solemn pronouncement in all the Bible. In what way is God's wrath being presently revealed? The answer to that is the most solemn pronouncement in the Bible. You see it three times here. God gave them up. In verse 24, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. Sinners gave up God. God's given up sinners. Oh, he can't do it. Well, he says he did. I don't know why that... So many marshmallow 
Christians think that God can't do what he pleases, ask God. Most people won't even allow God to do what they want to do with reference to God. Sinners gave up God. He says, I gave up sinners. Verse 24, he says it again in 26, in case you didn't get the message. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. He says it again in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, he gave them up to a reprobate mind. They don't want God on his mind, then he gives them up to an evil mind. Gives them up. You see, it's one thing for a doctor to tell a patient who is ridden with cancer, I just can't help you, and I have to give you up. Oh, those are sad, solemn words for people who don't know about divine healing. And it's generally not the time to try to get it when you're dying. Faith for healing. I'll tell you, we could spend an hour just right there. So many people who come to you in the meetings want you to agree with them for someone who's dying with terminal cancer. That's the first message they've heard on faith. They've heard you stress Matthew 18, 19, where two are agreed, and they want you to agree with somebody who's never heard of healing themselves in a coma. Now, God can do that. He has done it. But I don't go about the country agreeing with everybody on that sort of thing. I just tell them that they need to get the word into their hearts. The Word of God. Faith comes by hearing the Word, not by agreeing. That's one way, but that isn't the way God has ordained that everybody's going to get healed because somebody off in South America agrees for somebody in China to get healed. It's one thing, though, for a doctor to say, I have to give you up because I can't help you. It's one thing for a lawyer to say, your case is just too difficult. In fact, all the odds are against you. I can't help you. I have to give you up. It's another thing for a psychiatrist to tell a patient they're just too far gone out into orbit that they'll never get back. I can't help you. I have to give you up. It's one thing for sometimes hospitals where they send drug addicts. They just say, we have to give you up. You're beyond hope. It's one thing for a prison to tell a convict, we could never reform you. We just have to give you up. In all these cases, men have to give up, and they often do have to give up on people because they themselves are limited, finite in skill, ability, and knowledge. But God can do anything. And when he says he gives a man up, that means there's no hope. Oh, let's stay with the word. God gave them up to uncleanness, to vile affections, to a vile, reprobate, evil mind. That means that when God gives a man up, there's absolutely no hope for forgiveness or salvation unless, praise God for grace, (laughs) that he takes him upon himself some radical action to change this dilemma, this stalemate. And what did he do? He came down himself and took care of things. We were not redeemed by corruptible things. Jesus did not die spiritually, did he? No, God was in Christ. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. How could Jesus be (coughs) sinful on the cross, dying spiritually, forsaken of God? You can't divide the Godhead up. God was in Christ. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. Where did the Father and Spirit go? That's the Logos that took on flesh. That is the eternal Son of God. You can't kill the Spirit. That's why he had to take on flesh. If he could have done it in the Spirit, he wouldn't have bothered in the flesh. You can't kill the Spirit. Oh, I don't want to get off into it, but you can't kill a sinner spiritually. He's got eternal life. He spends it in hell. His soul is immortal. That isn't what is meant when we say sinners are spiritually dead. It means they're spiritually alienated from God. The life of God is not in them. But they have life, they're going to spend it in hell. Oh, it pays, as I say, to study the Word because people get all wrapped up in theological terms or words that they don't know what they mean when they run out of something to talk about and have to get a sermon and they launch out in some area that angels fear to tread. So God had to do something. Now, we're not going to leave it there because that is something that we should not take lightly or underestimate. That means there's no other way except through Jesus. And that means that when a sinner rejects him, God at any time, God at any time can give him up, literally give him up, because he has done that. And this passage shows that, that there comes a time when there is no hope. There is 
clear teaching in the Bible that there comes a time when it's too late for repentance. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, Hebrews 3 and 4. Because you can harden your heart once too often. So sin is so terrible in the sight of God that he had to give man up. But that's his wrath being revealed from heaven. But he's revealing his love through his son, Jesus Christ. Because over in chapter 2, verse 4, when we get there, we see that through the goodness and the forbearance and the long-suffering of God, he's leading sinners to repentance. This is the time to repent while you have time to repent. But don't think that you've got time until the second advent because sometimes God gives people up, totally gives them up. And this isn't popular theology, but nevertheless, it's the word of God. John 3.36 tells you that if you believe on the Son, you have everlasting life, but if you're not believing, that you'll never see life, and the wrath of God shall abide upon you. John 3.36. That ought to make people think that they don't have time to say, well, maybe tomorrow I'll get straightened out. And especially over in Hebrews 2, Verses 1 to 3, we see this truth. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense or reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? So it isn't a thing to deal with lightly. Now at the present time, God isn't waiting to pour out his wrath. At the present time, God's wrath is being revealed in three ways. First of all, he has given sinners up to uncleanness. Now we're looking at the side where God is giving up sinners. He also says there's a place for repentance. So keep the balance there. But nevertheless, until a sinner has repented, he has been given up. And there, so say, there comes a time when he gives up completely on some. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. That's the first giving up. Sinners gave up God, so he says, I'm going to give up sinners. The worst thing that can happen to you, dear friend, is for God to abandon you to your sin and your uncleanness and your wicked and your vice mm -hmm. and just let it work and eat on you like a cancer till it devours you. While there's yet to be a time of judgment, the Bible speaks of the great day of the Lord and the great day of judgment, which yet is to come. Nevertheless, the wrath of God has already gone forth. And you know what it is? He says three times here what it is to be forsaken by God and just be left in your corruption, giving you up to a vile mind, to corruption, to evil and vile habits and practices. So you have no promise. Repentance, just like faith, is a gift of God. You have no assurance that if you are in these sins, that you can just automatically someday go to the altar when it seems convenient to you and get saved. Going to the altar isn't getting saved. That's walking to an altar. That may mean you got saved. <laughs> Repentance is something besides just saying, I repent. It's something besides going to the altar. It's something besides making a confession of faith. All of those things are what I just said they were, but repentance is something else, as we will see. And so God says he gives them up. Sinners who give up God, who reject Christ, and some have never heard at all, so if you've heard once, that's sufficient. Sinners who have given up God, who reject Christ, are simply left to the mercy of Satan. They're just left in their sins, the consequences of their own perverseness. God, as it were, just leaves them alone. Look out in the world, you see it all the time. God's just leaving them alone. The word is here for them to hear, but you don't see anybody knocking the door down except charismatics to get in here. <laughs> is the world beating a path to your door, knocking your door down, trying to get saved? No. God has given them up. He's given them up to the consequences of their own sins. The consequences of sin is like a cancer. It's progressive. It just keeps eating and eating. It's the law of sowing and reaping. See, when Adam sinned, the next thing is a murder by his own son, and so on. And so man has devoluted. It's devolution, not evolution. Not evolution, it's devolution. <laughs> but it's the law of sowing and reaping over in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. 
is what God is putting into effect with regard to sinners. Galatians 6 and 7 and 8. To say that God has given up sinners, he's simply letting the law of sowing and reaping take effect. Verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. See, man can't violate the natural laws. The natural laws, what we call natural law, is the laws and principles that God has established and ordained. Man can't violate the natural laws without paying the consequences. The law of sowing and reaping of cause and effect always, always operating. I mean, if you touch a hot stove, you're going to get burned. Law of cause and effect, sowing and reaping. If you jump into 10 feet of water and you can't swim, you'll drown. If you jump off a 10-story building and you can't fly, you'll be smashed on the cement. Law of sowing and reaping, cause and effect. Worry will give you ulcers. So if you cannot violate and act in defiance against the laws of nature, then the laws of God, even more so is this true. The spiritual laws, moral laws, that if you're going to violate them, you're going to reap what you're sowing. That's what God is saying here in Romans. All right, he gave them up to uncleanness. You'll see in verses 26 and 27 that he says he gave them up to something else. He gave them up to vile affections, verse 26. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Lesbianism. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly. Homosexuality, sodomites. And then this phrase, the law of sowing and reaping, they receive in themselves the recompense of their error, which is meat. This is God's attitude toward sodomy, lesbianism, homosexuality, or what is commonly called oral sex in marriage. I want to tell you, friends, on the basis of the word of God, if you're involved in that, he says he's given you up. That's evidence he's given you up to be a sodomite, a lesbian, or homosexual. Oh, I hope I do shake people down to their boots. I didn't write it. I didn't say it. He did. That's evidence he's given you up. If you have that vile, reprobate mind, if you are living a life of uncleanness, if you're involved in sodomy, whether it's male or female, that's evidence God has given you up. And he says here that sodomites receive in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. And that's certainly true. I mean, if there's one thing is true, it's that nothing is more disgusting than to see a person with this moral disease. And I'm not going to pamper it and baby it and be emotional about it like some churches and people are doing. They're even writing books about it, charismatics. Understanding the homosexual. Well, I understand him perfectly. God has given him up. God destroyed Sodom because it was full of sodomites. That's where we get the name. It was so wicked. That's God's opinion. That's God's attitude toward it. Nothing is more disgusting because they're receiving in themselves. That's why you can tell a homosexual usually when you see it, whether it's male or female. I walk by people sometimes, just right away, I know homosexual or lesbian. I see women sometimes and wonder what's the matter with them, and it's very easy. They're lesbian. When I say what's the matter with them, I just feel in my spirit, and I know. I know because I know. And there are other ways to tell. You can tell by looking at some people. Their lives are characterized by all sorts of wrong, abnormal behavior, effeminate males, masculine women. Now, that isn't always true anymore. Since so many spirits are going forth, you have a lot of masculines who are homosexuals, but often they're effeminate and masculine women. And you talk about jealousies between male and female, you've never seen any jealousy till you see it between sodomites or homosexuals or lesbians. Sensual behavior, loss of morals and respect, self-respect, loss of modesty, no shame. They meet in stinking latrines, public toilets, to have their sexual activity. They've lost all sense of modesty and shame, dignity. And the more discerning of us can tell there's an unclean spirit. I can usually look at a person and tell if they're homosexual. Or to say it another way, I can a lot of times tell a person is homosexual or lesbian by looking at them. 
Now we've got one of the latest issues of Time magazines. Look at the title of it. If you can't read that, we'll pray for your eyes. I am a homosexual is the title. It's being glorified and publicized. I'll tell you, friends, they could take the title off and I could tell you he's homosexual. Yes, I could. If you can't see it, then ask God for discernment. It's there. You get up here close enough, you can see it in many ways. You can see it in the eyes. I can see it in the face. There are things I can describe that tell me he's homosexual. And this is one of the characteristics of the last days. Gays on the march. Mother Nature. Here are women marching. Lesbians. Mother Nature is a lesbian. And here's a mother with her son. My son is gay and that's okay. Public meetings and demonstrations for these people. That's why we say that you're opening yourself to a spirit of homosexuality if you practice oral sex and marriage, which to shock me when I discovered it was so popular among Christians. I get letters from people who said they didn't even know it was wrong until they heard me say it on a tape. God help us. And here's a religious service, serving mass, homosexuals, homosexual church, homosexual religious service. Here's a state representative, a doctor, and two legislatures, one a female and one a male, one a lesbian, the other one a sodomite, that openly now they boast of it. And all sorts of cruises and parties, you can go on cruises now where they're nothing but homosexuals, and they're openly coming out and admitting it public announcements of their sodomy by a variety of people, a Maryland teacher, a Texas minister, a Minnesota state senator, an Ohio professor, an Air Force sergeant. Your own husband may be homosexual, according to Red Book magazine. Five million admittedly homosexual, and the homosexuals say they're at least 20 million, because everyone won't admit it. Eleven state legislatures have followed Illinois in repealing their anti-sodomy laws. Well, we've got so-called churches that have homosexual parties and say that we should not criticize them. It's not deviation. It's just the way they express their sexual appetites. At a Texas-style party, some 300 ranchers, bankers, oil men, and politicians were there drinking, eating barbecue, Looked fairly normal. The only thing was they were all males and they were all homosexuals. And on and on and on. When they would put something like that on the cover of one of the leading magazines, it ought to warn you that we're in the last days. God has given him up. God has given a person up who's practicing it. And so if we can shock anybody into believing the seriousness of it in the sight of God, then that's the whole purpose. God has given them up in the third place, verse 28, to a reprobate mind. Reprobate means wicked and evil and corrupt. He's given them up to these things. People say, oh, God can't really give them up. You better stay out of 2 Thessalonians and Hebrews 12 and some other places. Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 and a lot of places. God is only going to put up with so much sin out of sinners. It doesn't mean that because a person has not been involved in certain things that he's more righteous as a sinner than someone who is a sodomite or something. That isn't what we're saying. But there are limits beyond which you cannot go and think that God is just going to put up with that. The wrath of God has already gone forth. He says, I've given them up to these things. God has given them up to a reprobate mind. Well, what is the result of having a wicked, evil mind? Well, look at what it's filled with. Verse 29. It's filled with all unrighteousness. So people don't think of anything but unrighteousness and fornication and wickedness and covetousness and maliciousness. It's full of envy and murder and debate. I'm glad he put debate in there because people who always want to debate anything, whether it's religion, they need deliverance. You don't have to debate the gospel, just speak the truth. But some people would rather debate something than to eat. Debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, you know, behind the back. And backbiters, you know, snapping back when you say something to them. Haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters. Mm. 
inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Of all the catalog of sins that show God's given a person up, this is one thing that characterizes that individual. He's disobedient to parents. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Now how can you know when a God has given a person up? Verse 32 tells you. They know the judgment of God. They know that they which commit such things are worthy of death. But they not only do the same, but have pleasure in doing them. If you want to know when God has given a person up, there's just no concern. Their philosophy is eat, drink, be merry, tomorrow we die, and we can't cure less. We're going into hell with a bottle of champagne under our arm and a woman hanging on the other. Yeah, that's how you can tell if God has given a person up. They are totally unconcerned, and they're unrepentant even in the midst of judgment. They remain unrepentant. Look at Revelation 9. 20 and 21, during the great tribulation. You'd think that would be enough to cause sinners to repent, the things that they have to go through in the great tribulation. But notice Revelation 9, verses 20 and 21. Now this is after many have been killed. Like verse 18, a third part of the men were killed by fire and smoke and brimstone, which issued out of these beast's mouths. Verse 20, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, and stone and wood, which neither can see, hear, walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, their occultism, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Right in the midst of that persecution. They watch a third of the population being destroyed by God's judgments, and they don't repent. Why? They can't. They can't. Repentance is a gift. Oh, yes, it is. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, because this is the time God's giving you to repent. Don't think that God is not going to judge sinners and your sin. He's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The delay, Peter says in 2 Peter 3, is salvation. Because God's delaying, that's salvation. But he said, don't think God is slack concerning his promise, but one day he's going to destroy everything with fire. 2 Peter 3. They're unconcerned and they're unrepentant. Why? Because God has given them up. Oh, no one's too deep in sin that he can't repent and come out of it. I didn't say that. The Bible says that though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. That is what we've said. But God does not present this weak tea, marshmallow kind of John 3.16 that's preached three times a week from the pulpits. He says today, if you hear his voice through the gospel, you better do something. You have no promise of a tomorrow. You have no promise in many ways tomorrow will come for you. It just may mean God will give you up because repentance like faith is a gift of God. Look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Which, by the way, now is going to bring us to another division of our studies in Romans. Now he's going to show the same thing about the Jews who are always critical even today of the Gentiles. They think only the Gentiles are wicked. But Paul's going to show that they too do the same things, need salvation, and need to repent. The apostles and the prophets didn't write in chapters. He said the Gentiles are unrighteous, condemned, and God has given up on many of them. Therefore, you see, he's still talking about that. Thou art, now he's coming to the Jew, thou art inexcusable, old man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. Why? For thou that judgest doest the same things. Now that's a principle applicable to all, as we'll get in next time. But I want to stick with this idea of repentance. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such thing. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things? What things? Those things we've just mentioned in chapter 1. He says, Do you think... O man, who are judging the Gentiles who do those things, and you do the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, 
not knowing that the goodness of God is leading thee to repentance. But after the hardness of thy heart and impenitent, unrepentant heart, you're treasuring up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. See, the Jew is sinning against the grace of God because he isn't repenting. He is misusing God's grace, which is being revealed through the gospel. And he is also misunderstanding the grace of God. He thinks because God isn't judging him and he's given the Gentile up, which is common knowledge to a Jew that God gave the Gentiles up because revelation came only to the Jew. He thinks because God isn't judging his sins immediately that God is approving his conduct. Now there's a lesson there, friends. You see, you can be doing something that you know in your spirit is wrong and God isn't judging it. And you get to the place where your conscience quits bothering you because you say, well... Uh, it must be all right. God really isn't concerned about this. But one day he's going to lower the boom, pull the rug out from under you. That's what he says here. He says, you're just storing up wrath against the day of when God does deal with you. You're just storing it up. Where you would get a little wrath, now if he dealt with it, you'll have a lot to deal with, a lot of wrath when God does begin to deal with it. So repentance. You see, it's too late sometimes for repentance. God does give people up. But at the same time, there is a place for repentance through the goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering of God, we see here. And make no mistake, God does require all men to repent. The only question is, have we repented? You see, repentance today is walking an aisle. It's making a confession of faith. Some don't even require that. It's getting baptized. That's repentance today. That isn't repentance in the Bible. Jesus said in Luke 13 concerning the Galileans who were put to death by Pilate, he said, do you think that they were sinners above all the Galileans? He says, nay, but I'll tell you this, except you repent, you'll likewise perish. He says that he calls upon all men, Acts 17.30, to repent. The thing is, have we done it? You know what repentance means in the Greek? It means to change your mind. It means change your mind. You know what it means in Hebrew? It means to change the way you're walking. It means to turn. And that concept of changing your mind and turning away from sin and back to God is basic in the Bible. Some people feel that, well, if I'm sorry for my sins, that's repenting. Well, it's good to be sorry for your sins, but that isn't repentance. We've got criminals who are sorry they're in jail, but they haven't changed. We've got murderers who are sorry they killed their wives or husbands or children. They're sorry they did it. But they haven't changed their mind about sinning. They haven't turned away from sin. And that's what it means in the Bible to repent. It means change your mind, your attitude, your whole outlook, and then do something about it. Turn around. The Greek is change your mind. The Hebrew is turn. Well, when you change your mind, you're turning it. See? Same idea. Same idea. In fact, I've got a book in my library called God's Word in Man's Language, which shows the translations, various translations of the Bible into all oh, many languages and dialects, hundreds, thousands, I guess, of them. And they deal with concepts like righteousness and justification and sin and repentance. And it's interesting. I checked through the book to see how they translate repentance. And every time this idea of changing your mind or turning is translated into every language in the world. Let me read some of them to you. I jotted some down here. In the natives in South Africa, repentance means to become untwisted. See, it's turning or changing. Conversion is to retrace your steps. See, turn and go back the other way. That's what happened to me that night that I got saved. I went to a nightclub, and God saved me on the way home. He just turned me around. So it means to retrace your steps. In Indonesia, it's putting on a new mind. You see, changing your mind. In Sudan, Africa, it's to turn the heart. In another language, it's to be sorrowful and turn. To the Indians, it's to be sorry in your heart and to change your heart. In southern Mexico, it's to leave sin. That's what repentance is I'm talking about. It isn't just saying, I repent. You leave sin. Another language is turning the heart upside down. Another one, it's turning back the heart. And another is to cause the heart to return to God. See, in every language, when they translate repentance, it means to change the mind or to turn from your sin and turn back to God. And see, it is right at that point we can ask ourselves, well, now, we've said we've repented, but have we repented biblically? 
If repentance means to change your mind, your attitude, your outlook, your interests, if it means that yesterday you were walking that way, today you're walking in the opposite direction, if it means that what you loved yesterday, now you hate, and what you hated yesterday, now you love, have you repented? Some haven't. I'll tell you, some of you repent tonight. I mean, when you find out what it is. You are not saved because you're here or joined this body. That's all that means, you've joined this body. You're not saved because you say, I believe in Jesus. Jesus said, that isn't salvation. That's where you begin. He said, it's he that does the will of my Father. And the will of my Father, he says, is to turn from your sins, to change your mind about sin. It's changing attitudes, interests, outlooks, likes, everything, your life. Same ideas in the Old Testament, over in Ezekiel 33, 11. You might want to look at that, because here you have the idea of a complete turning around if you've repented. Now remember in the Hebrew, the word is turn. The word to repent means turn, so it's translated that way here. Ezekiel 33, 11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Repent, he's what he said. Turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? See, the Hebrew word tells you what God wanted the Jew to do to prove he repented. He was to turn away from his sin, turn back to God. That's repentance. I didn't on the road home that nightclub say, Lord, I repent. I turn from that life to the life of God. So I know I've repented in the biblical sense. I changed my mind about sin. I didn't give up a love or taste for beer or cigarettes or nightclub. The flesh could still indulge in that, but the mind was changed. The me, the ego, the I, the personality, and the flesh was brought into control to that, is what Romans 6 is all about, by the way, and Romans 8. You're not to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And so to a Hebrew, he didn't have some abstract idea about repent and everybody have to run around and say, what's that mean? God said, turn, turn back to me. Why will you die? Turn away from your sin, turn back to me. He was saying, shuv, shuv, the imperative, return, turn, turn unto me. See, it was not some passive thing he did with his mind, just say, well, uh, think differently, but he turned his whole life, his whole being. And that's what John the Baptist is talking about over in Matthew chapter 3. You see, it makes sense when we study the Bible, some of the things that happen, some of the things they say. I was just sitting in there when I was praying and thinking of the weeks and months and years that Christians are waiting in churches, wasting in churches, to go to church and just to get entertained and get a little sermonette and go home and taught absolutely nothing for the most part. And the glorious opportunity we have and the privilege I've got to minister to people who want to learn that we don't have to apologize for teaching the Word on Sunday. We don't have to call it anything but what it is. A charismatic school, that's what it is in the Bible. Well, now, John the Baptist, you see, it makes some sense. He's baptizing in the wilderness. It says, prepare the way of the Lord, verse 3, the same John, clothed in camel's hair, so on. Then went out to him Jerusalem and Judea and all the region round about Jericho and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I have never made it that strong, and yet I had get letters and <laughs> reprimand sometimes because we come on too strong with faith or pointing out error. I have not called anyone yet a viper. <laughs> but look at verse 8. Bring forth fruits proving repentance, meet for repentance, and then come back and I'll baptize you. You see, there's no merit or magical power in the word repent. You don't repent because you say, I repent. John the Baptist said, you've got to do things to show you repent. Not works to be saved, but he says, I'm baptizing, and he calls it in the Gospels, it's called the baptism of repentance. John's baptism was the baptism of repentance. 
It wasn't a baptism that enabled you to repent. It wasn't a baptism where you repented out in the water. It was a baptism indicating you had repented by changing your mind, changing your life. And now you want to be baptized as a testimony to that. You get baptized after you've changed, even yet today. You know, that's the way it's supposed to be. So he says to them, you go first, do things that prove you've repented, because I know what you are doing is proof that you're unregenerate. By the way, why didn't John just go on and baptize them if the Old Testament saints were all unregenerate anyway? Just fill up the church and the pews. It's because he knew they were unregenerate. Why? Because they had no works of repentance. You turn over to Acts 26, 20. Then it helps what John said to them. It helps explain this passage. Acts 26, 20. He's speaking, Paul's giving his testimony, says, verse 19, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles. Now look at this. Here's what he preached, that they should repent and turn to God. See, there's the idea of turning. They should repent and turn to God and do works, meet for repentance. You've got to prove you repent. There's no merit in repentance. That's your duty. God commands all men everywhere to repent. If you repent, that's only justifying God, as we said this morning, proving his charge against it is right. You declare him to be right. But we have to do something in the Bible concept of repentance to show we've repented. Our life has to be changed. We change your mind or attitude or interest. Some people don't even change their interests after they join a church. That's repentance to them. They don't even repent with the word. They just join somebody somewhere. And you know, and they assume they've repented. They assume they're justified. They assume they're saved because they've gone through certain steps and certain processes. Well, repentance is something God gives you, we're saying. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 31, God exalted Jesus with his right hand to be a prince and savior to give repentance to Israel. He gave it to them. Then over in Acts 11:18, the Jews, when Cornelius and his house was saved, they said, God has now also granted repentance to the Gentiles. You see, in both cases, it's a gift of God. In 2 Timothy 2:25, Paul says that we should instruct sinners in meekness, hoping that God might give them repentance. You see, God always is the giver of repentance. And how do you receive this gift of repentance? Well, make no mistake, you're not to sit around, passively sit around, waiting for God to drop it into your lap like a gift. Make no mistake, he commands us to do the repenting. If you've heard the word, if you've heard the call to repent, if you found out you haven't repented, you just join some church, even this body, then start repenting. Not by saying you do, changing your mind in your life. See, some people only have a superficial reformation. It shows up in six months or a year or two. They fall back into sin. They didn't repent. Probably never told to repent. Not in our modern day. Except somebody on a street corner preaching some hellfire and brimstone, but outside that. No, God isn't going to drop repentance into your lap. But you're not going to repent until God gives it to you. So then how can we repent if it's a gift of God? How can we repent until we receive the gift? It's because God commands us. I want to show you two things. Why? That God can command it even if it is a gift, just like faith <coughs> is a gift. Is first of all, he's given you the place of repentance by your hearing the gospel. Now that's not insignificant because there are millions who've been given this hour, to this hour, no opportunity to repent. You can't repent until you have a basis for repenting. You first have to hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing the word. A man can't repent of sin until he finds out that he's a sinner under God's condemnation and Jesus is his Savior. So God has given you the place of repentance just by being here tonight or just being born in America, we could say. Have you heard the gospel? He gave you something he's not giving most of the world. Not most of it. He isn't. Billions have died without any hope. Only Israel had the revelation. The Bible's clear there. 
Every Gentile perished up until the time of the cross when the gospel began to be spread everywhere, except he became a proselyte. Now that's clear teaching of Scripture. People worrying about God being arbitrary because he elects some to salvation while most of the world perished. Most of the world perished. And yet will. Just face reality. How could they believe if they've never heard? Romans 10 asks the question. So rather than struggling with those questions, praise God that he's given you the place of repentance by letting you hear the gospel. Then secondly, according to Romans 2, if you'll turn back there, he's given you the opportunity to repent. And that's really all you need to know about the fact that repentance, like faith, is a gift. He says, do you despise the riches and goodness and forbearance and long-suffering in God? Don't you know that his delay of wrath, his delay of judgment, that it's his goodness leading you to repentance? But somebody says, I still don't understand it. He's given me the place of repentance. I've heard the gospel. He gives me an opportunity because I'm still living. He hasn't judged me fully yet. His wrath isn't fully inflicted upon me, but I still don't understand. If it's his gift, how can I repent until he gives me the gift? Well, dear friend, that's where the natural mind misses every deep truth the Bible. It misses it there on election. It misses it there on the gift of faith. It misses it there on grace. It misses it there on the gift of repentance. People who are always raising questions like that are the ones who never get anything from God. He didn't say you had to understand election, that faith is a gift, that repentance is a gift of God. Peter didn't go and say repentance is a gift to you, Cornelius. You can't repent till God gives it to you. I hope he does. He preached the gospel. Cornelius and his house repented, believed the gospel, and then they said, look, God's granted repentance to the Gentiles. You see, this is where the natural mind misses all these questions. You shouldn't come and hear the teaching on election. We're going to be getting into it unless you'll quit asking questions and let God be God. He'll answer a lot of them. You see, the natural mind misses these truths because it's always raising these hypothetical theological questions. And the Bible doesn't do that. It states the truth. It says, repent. It doesn't present the gospel. You can't repent till I give you the gift. It says, repent. If he commands you to repent, that means you've got a place, you've got the opportunity, you better get busy repenting. God doesn't send a soul to hell because it can't repent. He sends a soul to hell because it doesn't want to repent. It refuses. That's what he says there in verse 5. He says that it's the hardness of the heart, the impenitent heart, is why God is pouring out his wrath and going to pour out his wrath. No sinner ever said, I wish I could repent, but I can't. When did you ever hear a sinner say that? Oh, I wish I could repent, but I can't. I'm waiting for the gift. I hope I get it. Sinners don't want to repent. That's why God sends men to hell. He sends them to hell because they're sinners, not because they weren't elected. You see, that's what you've got to see and quit raising all these questions. You can do what the sinner did over in Luke 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 10. You can do this. Instead of raising all the questions about whether or not you're elected or whether or not you can be saved, if God has to give you the gift of faith and the gift of repentance, here's what you can do. Luke 18, verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a publican. Now, a publican and a sinner was the same thing because the word meant sinner to a Jew. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Notice with whom he prayed. When you pray like this, it isn't going out of the room. He prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican standing over there. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. But the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as lift up his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You can do that. And look what happens. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and everyone that humbles himself shall be exalted. He that cometh unto me, Jesus said, I'll in no wise cast out. Why don't you come to Jesus? Amen. The truth's there. The Bible, the writers of the Bible never apologize for the truth of predestination, election, that salvation is all by grace from beginning to end. That you can't even move in the direction of God until the Father draws you, John 6. But it doesn't go preach that. It says, repent, you're a sinner. Do like he did. 
smite on your breast and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He said, you'll go down to your house justified. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that the convicting work of the Holy Spirit will be completed in every heart. Those of us who know that we have received the gift of eternal life because we know we have repented in the biblical sense. And also that there will be deep conviction upon those who are not sure or who know that they have not repented in the biblical sense. God forbid that we should just have an academic exercise as we study these great truths, but let each of us examine our hearts. Let the Holy Spirit do his work in ministry. And Lord, may it be true that today if sinners, if doubters, those who are doubtful, have heard the voice of the Spirit speaking to them through this teaching tonight, we pray that by your mercy and grace you'll enable them to receive it as the word of the Lord and not harden their hearts, not be impenitent, but repentant in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. Now just keep your heads bowed because God wants to give you an opportunity to do something. Now with your heads bowed, how many of you, how many of you until you heard this teaching from Romans, how many of you thought maybe you had repented, but now you see that you haven't, that you haven't done it in a biblical sense? You want to raise your hand and tell God, there they are. Just raise them. Don't be ashamed. Now you see what to do. See, we could have you come up here and put on a demonstration, have people weeping and crying, but God sees your hand. And so by raising your hand, raising your heart to God, you just say, now, Lord, I see what it is. I've just joined a church, or I've just this or that and the other. Now I'm sure that I'm walking in the light that you've shown me that I am repenting. I'm changing my mind. I'm turning myself completely over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now you can carry that through to making a definite confession if that's the way you're being moved. If you see that it's just a concept that you held to before and not an actual relationship with Jesus Christ, then you can come, you can confess, and you can ask for scriptural baptism and so on. If there's some sinner here that wants to ask God to be merciful to him, a sinner, then God will not turn you away because Jesus said, Anyone that comes to me, I'll in no wise cast out. Hallelujah. Amen. We're just going to sing a chorus or two here, and if the Lord moves on you to make any kind of confession to receive Christ or to, by your own way there, to acknowledge to God that you understand repentance and you're now going to be sure of your position with Christ, then however you're led, you do it that way. Just make sure that you do it the right way. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thy love.